And as you know, I want to discuss the unique combination of economic and political dynamics since the global crisis of 2008 and 9. And I'll use as a starting point the wonderful formulation by Marx in a speech that he gave in the 1850s where talking about his world he said everything is pregnant with its opposite. Everything is pregnant with its opposite. And of course if we think today about our world it is a moment in which we see tremendous danger. There is tremendous danger in so many different forms from climate change to the growth of the far right. But there is also this historic window of opportunity for the radical left. And living now in the United States, later on in my talk, I will give you some specific examples based on my experience there uh, at the moment. But let us start with the big picture. In 2008 and 9, the world changed in a fundamental and profound way. And it did so because the neoliberal economic boom, the great expansion that began with the victory of neoliberalism from the late 1970s into the early 1980s, which politically involved defeating strategic sectors of the organized working class movement and restructuring and reorganizing the world capitalist economy. And I won't be able to give you any comprehensive analysis of that, but let me just remind you especially remind those of you who were not necessarily born uh, when some of these events happened, that politically we see the electoral conquests of neoliberalism with the elections of Margaret Thatcher in England and of Ronald Reagan in the United States. Each of them breaks key strikes by strategic sections of the working class. Margaret Thatcher defeats the British miners. This is an absolute game changer for politics in Britain. Ronald Reagan breaks a national strike of air traffic controllers. We look outside the global north, probably the premier example is the capacity of the Bolivian state to break the most powerful union in Latin America, the Tin Miners Union. And they break it in 1985. And so those political conquests by the neoliberal right open the door to a series of defeats of working class movements that give capital the space, give the ruling class the space to reorganize production, distribution, and exchange in ways that restructure the workplace, downsize workforces, de-unionize large sections of the working class, move to more contingent and casual kinds of labor. And of course, all of this is in the name of one thing, restoring profits, restoring profitability. Okay. And they succeeded. And we as a left are shaped by that great victory of the ruling class. This does not mean resistance disappeared. This does not mean the left disappeared. But it meant that the organized working class movement of an earlier historical period was losing ground. <coughs> Today we are rebuilding in the wake of that period, in the aftermath of that period. But I say that things changed in 2008 and 2009 because the 25 year neoliberal economic expansion came to an end. 
after those historic defeats of the working class movement, which I've described, by about 1982, you can see world capitalism recovering again, entering a long period of growth once more. And it does so for about 25 years without a global slump. Yes, there were recessions in different countries, there were debt crises in parts of the global south, but there was not a world recession. But the one that came in 2008 and 9 has to be counted among the four great slumps in the history of world capitalism. And I will say to you that the four great world slumps are the one that was first known as the Great Depression, 1873 to 96. That was actually called the Great Depression until the 1930s came along. And you can see a long period, a couple of decades, then the global crisis of the 1930s. Coming out of war, capitalism restored itself, but it took fascism and war for it to do that. And then another long boom of about 25 years, followed by a crisis from the early 1970s into the early 1980s. Then the neoliberal boom I'm de describing to you, and now the new period that we've entered since 2009. Now, this crisis looks different. It's why I've preferred to call it a global slump rather than a global crisis. Because if you say crisis every day, it becomes meaningless to people. But if you say it's a long slump, then we can begin to describe some of the key features. Because the rate of economic growth since 2009 has been the slowest of the post-World War II period. Let them tell you as much as they want about how we're in a recovery. It does not feel like a recovery to working class people. Okay, and the reason for that is classically in a recovery, you see growth rates of 6 and 8 and 10% in the early years. A big investment boom. Why? Because the crisis is when they wipe out the least efficient capitalists. They bankrupt them. That's what they did in the 1930s. That's what they did in the 1970s and early 80s. The least efficient capitalists get driven out. They get destroyed. That's one of the functions of a crisis for capital. Yeah. It makes a system efficient, please notice my quotes again, by destroying capital and destroying working class people's lives. This time around, so traumatized was the international ruling class by the banking collapse that began, that they did something that they did, had not done in any of these prior great slumps to which I referred earlier. That is to say, they injected literally endless amounts of central bank money into the economy. Those of us who've tried to measure the scale of the bailout in the United States alone agree that it ranges somewhere between $14 trillion and $21 trillion. Now notice, this is a country that, please see my quotes again, cannot afford Medicare. Okay? But they could afford trillions upon trillions of dollars to bail out the global banking system. But in doing this, and in entering into a project that they called quantitative easing, don't worry about the term quantitative easing. What did it really mean? Free money to capital. That's what it meant. They would bail out anyone and anything to keep the system going. When you read their memoirs from 2009, these people were genuinely traumatized. The finance secretary of the United States in his memoirs talks about the number of times he had to excuse himself from meetings while banks were collapsing and go and vomit in the washroom, throw up, and then come back to his meeting. This is how frightened 
and scared. They were. But they had one solution. Endlessly pump money into the system. Endlessly. We'll start with a trillion and a half. Not enough? More. But in doing that, there was a contradiction at the heart of it. It did save the banks. It did prevent a global financial collapse, no question. But it also prevented all of the processes of capitalist restructuring because why is, are any major sections of capital going to go bankrupt when there's free money? If you're not turning a profit, you can get it for money for free from the bank. And so what it meant was that the least efficient capitalists, the least profitable capitalists, have stayed alive throughout this crisis. There has not been a big contraction of capital with high bankruptcy rates. Then what usually follows in the history of capitalism is you drive out a lot of your competitors, you push down wages through mass unemployment, and it becomes profitable to start investing again and you get a new investment boom. We have not had a new investment boom. And so what's happening is we've got this period that's called the recovery and profits have recovered. But there has been no new wave of global capital investment, spending by businesses on new factories, on new technologies and machineries of production. They have not massively revolutionized their systems. If they've needed to expand, they've just added cheap labor. That's been their solution. And that's why, say, in the United States, it's true, the unemployment rate is not terribly high in the United States, but poverty is very high because they're working with a cheap labor model of growth. And that cheap labor model of growth is producing all kinds of class and social antagonisms that uh, we need to talk about. Before I turn to that, let me add for you that the so-called recovery phase since 2009 or 10 is clearly winding down now. There's no doubt. If you look at profits in China, which are nosediving, if you look at German economic growth, which is nosediving, if you look at the projections for profits in the United States, which are all downward, mm -hmm. it's also fair to say that probably the recovery phase of this period is winding down. We will soon enter another recession within the slump. And remember, even in the Great Depression, we had a cyclical movement of expansions and declines. After, from 1929 to 1933, it's all down. But then by 1933-34, it starts, the system starts to grow again. And then in 1937, it collapses again. So the idea that there are waves within a slump, that's nothing new. And that's all we're seeing right now, is my view is that we've reached a peak and it's about to turn down. And that is going to produce huge challenges because the far right, as soon as unemployment starts to go back up, are going to be mobilizing again about immigrants and Muslims as the cause of everything that's wrong in our society but it's also going to deepen much of the class anger and class bitterness that exists within this society. So let me say a little bit uh, about that class anger and bitterness. And I'm going to start by giving you a quotation from a recent edition of the Financial Times of London. And the Financial Times, like most serious capitalist papers, is obsessed with the United States. Uh, you know, they understand that it's the economic and political center. And so they write in a recent edition, why now, 10 years on from the global financial crisis, after seeing stock markets and profits hit new highs, true, stock markets have been rising, and a Republican president cut corporate tax rates, true, Trump's cut tax rates, and regulations uh, at their urging, do America's leading capitalists sound so uneasy? 
You know, remember this. They sound so uneasy. And by the way, living in the United States, every week there are new articles with American capitalists warning about the growth of socialism. Okay? About their fear of mass discontent. And so the Financial Times continues. One answer, according to some, is fear. Part of what scares them is politics, says Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation. Quote, what really scares them is when they look at the data showing younger people are increasingly comfortable with socialism. <laughs> that is incredibly frightening to them. Why you, why you? Okay? And in a few minutes, I want to come back and talk about what's happening uh, on the American left. But I just want to give you a, a little bit of context for that first. Because what we are seeing, remember I used the term that they are using cheap labor growth. And what that means is that in the United States we are seeing the logic that Marx lays out in his famous chapter called The General Law of Capitalist Accumulation in Capital. We are seeing so clearly. Marx says economic and social polarization is the dynamic of the system. The incredible growth of wealth at one pole and the growth of poverty, hardship, and misery at the others. And for a long time, people said, well, Marx clearly got it wrong. After all, wages ra rose all throughout the post-World War II period and so on. But it's starting to look again like that was the exception. Of course, we need to be able to explain those exceptions, account for why they come about, but the world today looks dramatically like the world that Marx described there. And it looks like it on a global scale, but it looks like it in the richest country in the world. The bottom 50% of Americans have seen no growth in real living standards for 45 years. The youngest generation in the workforce sees themselves not as upwardly mobile, but as downwardly mobile. They do not expect to live as well as their parents did. An extraordinary fact in the richest country in the world. Since 2016, life expectancy in the United States has been falling. Imagine that. In the richest country in the world, life expectancy is declining. The system is producing more wealth. The system's capacity to provide ever higher living standards is going up, and yet we have that. To give you one statistic that in many ways encapsulates it, a key issue in every capitalist country, but especially in a country like the United States where social welfare networks are so weak, is of course retirement. How are you going to live when your working days are over? Mm -hmm. In the United States today, 100 chief executive officers, okay, 100 of the 1%, in other words, 100 of the richest people in the United States have more retirement savings than 116 million working class people. Okay? They have more per capita than a million each. And so that reality is deeply understood within this society. There's no secret about it. The problem is that the right can speak to it with a right populism, Trump, okay? And the neoliberal center cannot speak to it. This is why Trump beat Hillary Clinton. Trump could have been beaten. I will tell you right now, Bernie Sanders could have beaten Donald Trump, right? Because there was a social democratic articulation of those class realities coming from Sanders, and there was a right-wing populist version coming from Trump. 
but the center neoliberal version that won't even acknowledge <coughs> what is happening to the majority had no chance. Absolutely no chance. And so this is why we're also seeing the fraying of the neoliberal center as it loses its social base today. And the danger for us is the right capturing that discontent. Because one of the things we know from all the electoral studies in the US is that many of the working class people who voted Trump were also very favorable to Bernie Sanders. We know that. All the data shows us this. The same working class bases. And so this becomes the political problem of the moment. And of course, we see this pattern elsewhere. Now, this, of course, then raises important questions and challenges for those of us on, on the radical left. And I just want to, to spend a couple of minutes on that. Because one of the things that emerged out of the 2016 campaign in the United States was the growth of a small mass socialist left again in the US for the first time since the 1940s. There was the beginnings of such a growth during the new left of the 1970s, but for all kinds of reasons, the organizing of the socialist elements within that new left came late in the day quite often, and when it did, it came with all kinds of political problems, and I'm happy to talk about that in the discussion period if people would like. But the Sanders campaign, to the amazement of many of us, rejuvenated a social democratic organization called the Democratic Socialists of America, who had about 6,000 members at the time of the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016, and today have over 60,000 members, and whose membership today is overwhelmingly under 30 years of age the vast majority of the tens of thousands who have joined are young. Okay, And so we now have, it's not a revolutionary organization, don't anyone with, misunderstand me. There are very good committed Marxist socialist activists within it. Absolutely there are. But they, it is a very fluid organization. The predominant politics are a kind of left social democracy, but very, very open politically. It's not, there's no great entrenched labor bureaucracy, for instance, able to police and drive out dissidents, as often happens in large mainstream social democratic parties. It's very open right now. Someone like myself can go to meetings and speak and get all kinds of support. Lots of uh, sympathy, uh, for instance, in, in meetings like this. And so what this has meant is that everyone who is serious on the left in the US, and I think this is a challenge for all of us internationally. I have largely been organizing until my recent move to the United States. I have been organizing largely in Canada. But it's going to raise a fundamental challenge for all of us which is that we are going to need to figure out how to orient on the emergence of new lefts that don't come out of radical socialism. They come out of the Corbyn campaign in the Labour Party in Britain. How is the radical left going to relate to that? A Labour Party-based push to the left, for instance, that creates all kinds of new space for the political discussion and the organization of socialist politics. The growth of the Democratic Socialists of America, as I say, a left social democratic current, but in which for the first time, I now live in Houston, Texas, I repeat, Houston, Texas, with a Democratic Socialists of America branch of more than 600 members. Okay, In the state of Texas, there are a few thousand. Okay, this is meaningful. This is important in terms of left politics. Some of you in the room will know that the International Socialist Organization in the United States has collapsed. 
I won't go through the details of that, but I will say to you that I believe, leaving aside all of the specific elements, the backdrop to the crisis is this growth of left social democracy, which was pulling many of their members over the last two years out of their ranks and into this current. And it's raising very, very big challenges for radical socialist politics that simply say, join our small group. Okay? I think it's great to have radical socialist groups. Don't anyone misunderstand me? I belong to many. Okay? But radical socialist groups today need to be thinking and organizing with a sense of we want to be part of a much broader formation on the left. And we are very happy not to own it, not to control it, not to dominate it, but to be a current that argues Marxist, revolutionary, in, internationalist, anti-racist, anti-patriarchy politics in the movement. But we actually, I think we want to be part of something larger. The worst thing are the sectarians who go, oh, isn't that terrible? DSA has 60,000 in the United States. No, no, that's not terrible. This is good. There are lots of political problems that we need to work on, but this is good. The fact that, I'll give you one last uh, statistic before I end. The recent Harvard University poll that showed, quote, a clear majority of U.S. residents between 18 and 35 say they are working class, and a Gallup poll done last year, the percentage of 18 to 29 year old Americans who have positive views of socialism hold steady at 51%, but the percentage saying they have positive views of capitalism has fallen every year since 2010. Right? Majority of Amer young Americans say, yeah, <coughs> socialism sounds good. All right. This is a huge opening, but it's also one that challenges old ideas of thinking, oh, if we just get two new members of our small group, that's building the revolutionary movement. No, no, no. We've got to be thinking today with the scale of how the world has changed since 2008 and 9, much, much larger terms, be thinking about how radical and revolutionary socialist currents can be contributing to building much, much larger formations and projects on the left. And I think that's the challenge of this period. So thank you.